All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm grateful once more uh, to uh, Amitabh and PCSI for the invitation. Um, so, uh, we've been discussing sinus venosus uh, defects and catheter closure a couple of days ago as well. So, it's a, a fairly recent innovation and so uh, it's a hot topic. These are my disclosures. I want to acknowledge, acknowledge the team uh, at Evelina and King's College, uh, Eric Rosenthal in particular, my colleague, uh, who uh, both of us developed um, a lot of the steps and the equipment for uh, this. Um, I'll skip, uh, in interest of time, I'll skip past uh, the uh, morphological details, but um, the initial assessment after the normal echocardiogram is by transesophageal echo, and you can see here, uh, a sinus venosus defect with left to right shunting and overriding of the superior vena cava. And often it's associated with, or invariably it's associated with uh, uh, partial anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. And in particular, uh, the right upper pulmonary vein uh, may drain in different locations in the SVC RA junction or uh, a little bit higher up or even further higher up. So. Uh, that's an important part of the evaluation to look at the uh, defect suitability for um, uh, covered stent implantation. So uh, what are the requirements for uh, doing a catheter repair or putting a covered stent? Well, suitable anatomy is one. Whatever we put in the defect, uh, we need to abolish the left-right shunt. We need to maintain uh, patency of a uh, right upper pulmonary vein draining to the left atrium without occlusion or stenosis. And there should be no SVC stenosis. And so uh, invariably CT scanning in particular, and sometimes MRI help us to select the right patients for repair. And ultimately what we want to do is put in some sort of a stent, covered stent uh, in that type of shape um, in such a way that uh, when it's in the SVC, the pulmonary veins drain into the left atrium in an unobstructed manner. Uh, we started the program several years ago, six years ago now, uh, using 3D printed models. And so we could play around with these models uh, and put in uh, uh, stents and balloons and uh, dilators really to show feasibility of uh, um, a catheter repair. And you can see here, there are some patients in whom we uh, had to determine whether right upper pulmonary vein needed to be protected with a balloon or not. Uh, and then more recently moved away from uh, 3D prints to virtual reality. And you can see here, we can put in a stent in the defect and then uh, evaluate uh, on virtual reality that the pulmonary veins drain to the left atrium in an un unobstructed manner. And so this sort of virtual reality program, this one in particular is by Lucis uh, Realized Medical, uh, really helps us and gives us confidence about uh, procedures. I think this is not going to work. No. So we uh, do a balloon interrogation using an ASD sizing balloon, uh, and that's combined with uh, an angiogram in the SVC as well as in the right um, upper pulmonary vein in order to show us the patency and uh, uh, non-compression. Non yep, this isn't going to work. Uh, and then uh, we put in a stent, and usually these are custom-made Tenzig uh, covered CP stents, sheet and platinum stents. Um, the length is the uh, crucial factor, really. Um, we started with five centimeter and six centimeter long, and gradually we've gone up to seven and eight centimeter long as well. But if you put in a short stent, which is the vogue uh, in many places nowadays still, uh, then you, uh, there is a small risk of uh, the stent migrating towards the right atrium. And so you have to put in a anchoring stent and that can be a bare stent. You'll see in these bottom two pictures, there's an anchored, uh, anchoring stent in, at the top end of that the, uh, covered stent. Um, and so uh, transesophageal echo evaluation is important to show uh, that the pulmonary veins are patent. Oh, these pictures work. This is a Tenzig air at eight centimeter long covered uh, CP stent. The advantage of a longer stent is that 
you may not need an anchoring stent, but also there's a bit more stability. So you see here the positioning. Now the inner bib balloon is being inflated. And after checking its position, the outer balloon is inflated. And then once we're happy with that, there are occasional patients in whom flaring is required of the lower end, and we use a coda balloon to do that. Um, it's important, again, as I keep emphasizing, transesophageal echo is essential because what you want to sh be sure of is that the stent in the bottom right picture, uh, the stent is uh, uh, opposed to the septum there because any more flaring here, it's possible that the stent will flick across the defect into the, towards the left atrium and result in a residual shunt. Um, so th these are examples of perfect anatomy. So you see here the right upper pulmonary vein draining uh, to the posterior part of the SVC. And you see that on angio as well on the lateral projection is the posterior part. And if that happens, then uh, those pulmonary veins are likely to be divertible. But when the pulmonary vein drains into the lateral part of the SVC, uh, then it may be under threat. So that's what we have to really check. Here's a balloon interrogation. And you can see occasionally with the compliant balloon, there is a bulge of the balloon as you inflate it into the pulmonary vein. You can see that nicely here on the lateral projection, the bulge is going posterior. And so some, uh, we can check the angiograms and if the bulge doesn't cause compression, then uh, that's fine to go ahead with, but occasionally it does cause compression. We check all that by uh, checking pressures in the left atrium and right upper pulmonary veins simultaneously. And if both the pressures go up and there's no gradient, then that's fine. Uh, we check on Doppler as well. But there are occasions where when you inflate the balloon, uh, there is a gradient between the left atrium and uh, uh, left atrium and the right upper pulmonary vein. And you know that that pulmonary vein is going to be compressed. And so you have to take steps to avoid that. So here's a, uh, a stent in place, and you can see a tiny or oh, very small residual shunt. Uh, and you can then uh, try and flare the bottom, bottom end like that. And that should abolish uh, the left right shunt and uh, maintain patency of the pulmonary vein. So which ones can you not stent? Well, when the defect is too large, for example, there are very uh, occasional ones that are three centimeters long. And then you're gonna, if you do attempt those, you're gonna need 10, 11 centimeter long stents, uh, but otherwise that's one to avoid. And when there are significant upper pulmonary veins uh, in addition to the normal position one. So uh, these are ideal pulmonary veins, uh, but uh, that you can divert towards the left atrium. But when there are additional pulmonary veins like that, uh, then you, there's really no way we're going to be able to divert those into the uh, left atrium. And so we uh, generally refer those patients to the surgeons. Um, and if this pulmonary vein, right upper pulmonary vein, drains to the lateral side of the uh, SVC, then it is likely to be compressed as well. So it's going to be unsuitable. Here's a uh, uh, one with balloon interrogation showing um, holdup of contrast uh, with uh, a sizing balloon. We then thought we'd try a non-compliant balloon uh, and uh, that showed still some holdup. Uh, that was a 26 millimeter. Then with a 22 millimeter non-compliant balloon, uh, there is no holdup of contrast, but there's residual shunting. So you then have to make uh, all kinds of decisions, because if you oversize the stent, then this is what's going to happen. There will be a gradient, as I emphasized before, and then you have to decide on protecting that right upper pulmonary vein. So here we've got an atlas balloon in the right upper pulmonary vein, a lateral projection, and we've produced an indentation uh, of when you're inflating the uh, covered CP stent. And that then allows the pulmonary vein to be protected. Um, there's the angiogram afterwards. There's a tiny little residual shunt. And then again, we can flare a little bit more of that and uh, that gets rid of it. So uh, 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 protection of the right upper pulmonary vein is very important. As you can see here, in this particular case, uh, we implanted a 
uh, an anchoring stent as well uh, before doing the flaring. Um, so this is, is the sort of case I wanted to highlight, the right upper pulmonary vein uh, draining into the lateral part of the SVC. This is a posterior view. There's the right upper pulmonary vein coming into the lateral part of the SVC. That's likely to be one at high risk of occlusion and therefore it should be uh, referred to the surgeons. Here's an example of uh, 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 up, a additional right upper pulmonary vein that uh, has got contrast hold up. Uh, here is another one with a uh, further pul pulmonary vein higher up, and there's no way we're going to avoid blocking those off. Um, and in some cases, uh, protection with um, a balloon is unhelpful, um, and so you have to make a decision with the surgeons about referring those patients. This is one where we uh, wanted to be sure, so we put two balloons. So there's an atlas balloon in the pulmonary vein and a no, uh, normal sort of non-compliant balloon in the SVC. And you can see when you inflate both, how the uh, atlas balloon is pushed back like that. And then when you uh, deflate, the atlas balloon is pushed forward. So even if you protect the, that pulmonary vein and put a stent in, when you deflate that uh, 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 atlas balloon in the pulmonary vein, the stent is likely to compress the uh, 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 pulmonary vein, and therefore that's not one that should be attempted. Here's one example where the pulmonary vein was covered with a covered stent. Uh, there was a complete occlusion, and about three months later, this patient uh, had hemoptysis and had uh, finished up with the lobectomy. So in those cases, when there, is a, a, there are additional pulmonary veins higher up, we usually discuss with the surgeons, and if they say they would leave that residual shunt. So then we uh, put a stent in, uh, including a bare stent to cover that uh, additional pulmonary vein. But if they say they will re uh, redirect all the pulmonary veins, then those patients are referred for surgery. So to conclude, uh, about three quarters, uh, we in practice, three quarters of our patients have, have been suitable for sinus venosis defect uh, closure with covered stents. Transseptal access is important and helps. Pulmonary vein obstruction is unlikely when compliant balloon testing re reveals um, a defect occlusion and free flow from the pulmonary vein to the left atrium. Pressures need to be demonstrated in the pulmonary vein and left atrium, and both of them may, will increase without a gradient. But if there is a res residual gradient or contrast hold up, uh, in the pulmonary vein when you inflate the balloon uh, then uh, and TOE shows uh, turbulent flow, then either the pulmonary vein protection is required or that patient should not be attempted. I'll stop there. Thank you very much.